Aloha. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. You can go to Lovey in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to Lovey in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to Lovey America and become an American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, a bi weekly interview program featuring the lives of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion. Created by Think Tank Hawaii and Kingsfield Law Office, we invite renowned immigrants to discuss their life stories, immigration adventures, and their contributions to cultural diversity. Today's guest is Professor Biu Ong Ting, professor and founding director of the Immigration and Deportation Defense Clinic and Dean Circle Scholar at the University of San Francisco School of Law. Thank you so much to be on the show, Professor Hing. We are very honored to have you. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's uh, uh, from your uh, name, and uh, I happen to uh, search your last name in Chinese language, and it appears your last name is Deng. That's correct. It's a quite a popular uh, Chinese last name. And you are the professor of law and migration studies at the University of San Francisco and a professor of law and Asian American studies emeritus at UC Davis. You previously on the law faculties at Stanford University and the Golden Gate University, and you founded the Immigration Legal Resources Center in San Francisco and direct the Immigration Deportation Defense Clinic. And you uh, have a tremendous uh, scholarship. You have published many books. And also, you teach immigration law and policy, migration studies, rep, rebellious lawyering. That's very sounds very interesting course and evidence. And, and your most recent book is a humanizing immigration: how to transform our racist and unjust system. That's very, you know, harsh criticism of our immigration policy. But you have co-counseled in the United States Supreme Court asylum precedent setting. Case INS versus uh, Cardoza Fonseca. That's an extremely impressive resume, Professor Hing. And I have uh, hundreds of questions I would li like to ask you. But let's start with your uh, uh, cultural identity. So you are a uh, second generation uh, Chinese American, aren't you? That's correct. My, my father was born in, in mainland China. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in Guangzhou province, actually uh, near near Hoisan, but actually we're from Hoipeng. Uh, mm. And my mother is actually curious uh, situation. She was actually born in Scranton, Pennsylvania in oh. 1901. But then when she was two or three years old, her mother took her back to China to mm. care for the grandmother. And so um, my mother really, she was born in the United States, but she didn't re-immigrate until after she married my father in the 1920s. Uh, didn't she has, uh, have the uh, birth right to be a U.S. citizen? Uh, should she just uh, apply? That's a very good question. <laughs> and the answer is actually no. Mm. Because there was a period of your question is well founded. Because usually, when you're born in the United States, you are a U.S. citizen, and Correct. there was a U.S. citizen because she was born in Pennsylvania. But there was also a law when when she got married to my father in 1921. There was a law in the United States that if if a citizen woman married a foreign male. The U.S. citizen woman would lose her U.S. citizenship. Wow. That, that applied to all women who were U.S. citizens who married foreign nationals, not just Chinese. So technically, she lost her U.S. citizenship when she married a foreign national. Unbelievable! What? What? what so, because this law you mentioned, this law applied to all. A female U.S. citizens. So that I assume that was not Chinese Exclusion Act related. No, but, it was not. Mm -hmm. it, it was a very gender sexist law sexist, yes. part of the United States that 
the belief was that, well, you know, if you're a woman and you marry somebody, well, then you've got to follow your husband. And so if he's a citizen of Germany or Mexico, well, then you should be a, you, you should go with your husband. You're, you're not no longer a U.S. citizen. Interesting, I have to say, that appears our immigration system was not only racist, but also sexist, sexist at least for a certain period of time. Very uh, much so. Mm -hmm. So when your parents got married? They got married in 1921 in China. Mm -hmm. My father had immigrated to the United States about 1915. Incidentally, with false papers, we can come back to that if you yeah, want. Paper, paper songs. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, and so he made a false claim to U.S. citizenship. But after he lived here uh, for about five years, he decided to go back to China to find a bride, which was common. And because there were not many women, not many Chinese women mm -hmm. in the United States, a bachelor society. And so he went back to China and through a marriage broker um a matchmaker he met my my mother and they got married in 1921 in china in in guangzhou yes guangzhou right. the 21 uh that was the warlord period uh, wasn't it it's uh china was not in very good shape but relatively it's better than the uh, than the late qing dynasty uh, and you were born uh, in in the forties, I believe. Yes. So yeah. I'm the youngest of. Hold on to your seat, okay? okay. I, I, I'm the youngest of ten children. Wow. So, yeah, I was Big born, family. I was born in 1949, but my oldest sister, who who has passed away, she was actually born in 1926. So mm -hmm. there's a wide span of my brothers and sisters in terms of uh, age. Well, happy for you. You have a very big family. I only have one sister, and and I hope I ha I had more. I, I really would love to have a brother. But anyway, uh, so all your uh, uh, siblings were born in the United States from twenties. No, actually, no? Um, when in the nineteen early nineteen thirties, before I was born, my my parents, my mother went back to China. Mm -hmm. Again, to, to take care of her mother. Oh, I see. And yeah. So she took she took the first four children with her, mm -hmm. and and then my father went to visit, and my mother got pregnant, and so actually, the 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 fifth child in the family was actually born in China. Mm. But every and then they they returned because of World War Two, as you know, you know Japan started. Mm -hmm bombing yes. China. And so they fled, I think the date was 1938, that they fled China on a boat uh, oh to come back to the United States. Well, glad that they came back. It's uh, 38 was was a very horrendous years uh, in China. And uh, uh, you were born in the United States, and you were educated in the United States, and uh, your, your work and your study focus on your scholarship, focus on immigration policy and the race relations. So obviously we can understand that there is, a, as a second generation immigrant, you have uh, some interest in immigration policy and also because of your parents who were first generation immigrants. And, but, and our impression, my impression is that uh, very few scholars really study the interdisciplinary uh, arena of immigration and uh, race relations. How do you see these two issues? They are vitally important. They are two of them. I think they are two, probably two most important issues in the United States right now. And how, but how do you see the two issues intersecting and what impact do they have on our society? Yeah, that's a very good question. The way I, I see it is that immigration law, unfortunately, had a lot of racist provisions that were part of the law. And you already alluded to one. The first one was the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Is it specifically racist? But 
and, and so I could see the effect of that in my own family and our relatives, of course, you know, because of, of, of paper sons and, and wrong, different surnames and that type of thing. But I also saw that where I grew up. I actually grew up in Arizona in a small, oh, okay. yeah, in a small copper mining town. And many of my friends and relatives, many of my friends growing up, my classmates were of Mexican descent. And so, you know, look, looking back on that, I, I believe that some of those families were undocumented. And then when I started practicing immigration law, I realized that at that time in the 1970s, much of the focus for deportation was directed at Mexicans. And so it was very, the, the enforcement priorities back then were focused on the deportation of Mexicans and the, and the Mexico-U.S. border back then in the 1970s. And anyone who's paying attention to the immigration law today, we, we know that the, the same border is a big challenge. Uh, it's, it's not so much Mexicans anymore, but it's other Central Americans and people from all over the world. So my, my answer is that it's very clear that the laws and the enforcement priorities have picked on certain immigrants of color. And, and so that's the, the relationship between the law and racism. Thank you very much for your explanation, Professor. And it makes perfect sense to me. As an immigrant, I uh, studied the law uh, because I've studied civil rights, the uh, race theory, critical race theory, and the civil rights movement in the United States. And I uh, can intuitively feel that there is a connection. And I couldn't as articulate as you just said. I really appreciate that. As lawyers and, uh, and uh, a law professor, uh, we probably all very much uh, following what's happening with the United States Supreme Court. So I was very uh, impressed to know that you co counsel in the NS versus Kazoda Fonseca case. And that case was about uh, asylum, I believe, and well founded fear. And could you uh, just tell our audience that uh, how did you get involved in the case? And uh, so some in, in, inner working of the uh, uh, co-counseling in a Supreme Court case and what impact this case had on immigration law and the protection of asylum seekers in the States? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, Cordoso Fonseca is the major Supreme Court case where the court determined what is the burden of proof Mm -hmm. when somebody applies for asylum. In other words, how much proof that do they need to introduce to be granted asylum? And the term that is used in the immigration laws is, do you have a well-founded fear of persecution? Nobody knew what that meant. And so the case was being handled by a friend of mine who volunteered to represent this woman from Nicaragua who wanted to apply for asylum. And it was very soon after the 1980 Refugee Act was passed in Congress. This, and that's when this term, well-founded fear of persecution, was made part of the immigration law. So it's the, it's the first case that made it to the Supreme Court. And she, th this woman, Dana uh, Marx, uh, who later became an immigration judge, she, this was her first immigration case. <laughs> so she oh. asked, she was, she was volunteering. So she asked me to help her. Um, and so the two of us, and, and we recruited two of our other very smart friends to write the brief because we won. I argued the case at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and oh. won. But then the government appealed to the Supreme Court. And of course, Dana wanted to argue the case at the Supreme <laughs> Court. Uh, and, and and I didn't get a chance to, to argue the case, but but I helped to write the brief. And so the importance of the case is that this is unbelievable. OK, it's mm -hmm. hard for people to understand that what well-founded fear of persecution, the Supreme Court said it should be a humanitarian interpretation. Mm. That it's not like a regular court case. 
And and again, I'm going to be technical very quickly here, but lawyers are familiar with two standard types of burden of proof. One mm-hmm. is called preponderance of the evidence, and the other is beyond a reasonable doubt. And yep. so your listeners all know, oh, beyond a reasonable doubt, that's in a criminal case, right? And so that requires a lot of evidence for the government to prove that somebody is a guilty of a crime, right? Preponderance is usually what's used in a civil case. Like if, if a car accident or a contract dispute, you have to show by a preponderance. And again, without getting too technical, usually preponderance means you have to show like 51% likelihood, yes. more yes. likely than yeah. not, yeah. That, that, that the red car ran the red light or that the 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 defendant breached the contract. You have to show fifty one percent proof that the contract was broken. Well, the Supreme Court said those don't. Neither one of those apply. That it is, should be more generous. And the Supreme Court said it should be only ten percent likely mm. that if there's a reasonable possibility of persecution, then the person should be granted asylum. And they define that as if there's just a one in 10 chance that you're going to be persecuted, it should be granted. And so that's the law today. Now, I think many judges uh, and the government, they usually require too much evidence, but that law has never been changed. The Supreme Court has never reversed its decision. So, you know, being part of the litigation team, we're very proud of that decision because it means that you're supposed to give the benefit of the doubt to the applicant. And that makes sense, right? Because if you're going to make a mistake in an asylum case, then the mistake should be let the person stay, even if they're not going to be persecuted. That should be the mistake. The mistake should not be deport somebody, even somebody who, who is going to be persecuted and they might get killed, right? You should err on the side of being careful and and being beneficial and humanitarian to the asylum applicant. Well, uh, you should be very proud. We are very proud for you because this case and you participated uh, and uh, co-counseled uh, is a Supreme Court precedent uh, p- potentially saved a thousand or thousand people's lives. And uh, uh, fortunately, that was that was Rehnquist Court, wasn't it? 1980s. Yeah, it, it was, and it, we got, believe it or not, we got six to three, in wow. case, including Scalia. Scalia so, joined the majority. He, you know? he was in a concurrence with the majority. So, okay, the majority was authored by Justice Stevens, believe? Stevens, yeah. yeah. We're very proud of that. You're right. Wow. You, 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 your brief must be so well crafted and uh, Scalia liked it. <laughs> he liked a well crafted, well reasoned, you know, legal argument. And very happy for you. And uh, I, I'm not sure this court, this current Roberts court, would have the same outcome. You know, Rehnquist court, even they have so many uh, controversies, but uh, the justices, they are, or most of them are, were very serious about the law. They really look at the law, and you just articulated so compellingly and exactly why they should rule in your favor, because you are, because of what is at stake here. Moving uh, fast forward to today, and you just released a book, Humanizing Immigration. You argued that immigrant and refugee rights are part of the fight for racial justice. You have already elaborated that uh, during our uh, previous questioning, question and answer. And in this book, you offer a humanitarian approach to reform and abolition of the immigration system. So that was quite a, sho- a shocking word. Could you elaborate the word abolition? And are you arguing the same as defund the police? And, and as you are uh, arguing, abolishing the immigration system? That's a very, very good question. Uh, am I equating uh, abolish ICE with defund the police? <laughs> and, and honestly, um, I am. Okay. And I, I, I think we need to tear down the system and start all over again. 
I know that there needs to be immigration laws. Okay. Uh, I understand that. But as I said at the beginning, the way the law has been enforced and the and what is contained in the laws, it's been racial. And let me give you an example in particular that hurts Asian immigrants. Right now, there's a backlog for people who want to immigrate from China, people who want to immigrate from the Philippines, from India, from South yes. Korea. There's backlogs. And the reason why there are backlogs is that they treat the immigration laws, treat all those countries the same in terms of numerical limitations, about 26,000 visas each year. Yeah. But it shouldn't be that way. It, it was started in a racist way. Back when the Chinese exclusion law passed in 1882, that was soon followed by restrictions on Japanese immigrants through yep. an international yep. agreement. Then there was something called the Asia Pacific Triangle that excluded other Asians. And then finally, it, it made it clear in the 1920s that Asians were not even eligible to apply for naturalization. So immigrants couldn't who, from Asia couldn't get naturalized. And so mm -hmm. that's what the system was based on. And so that's why there's such a long backlog in some situations, 15 to 20 years. And so that's why, to me, you, you have to totally redo the visa system so that do it on a first come, first serve basis. Let people apply. And I know there has to be a numerical limitation, but it, 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 but it should go by demand. If there's high demand from an Asian country, well, then they should get more visas. We mm -hmm. should go by demand. That wasn't my idea. That idea, believe it or not, was John Kennedy's idea. Oh, when yeah, he, of course. A nation of immigrants. President, he was very egalitarian. And he thought there should be a first come, first serve system. He was actually embarrassed by the Chinese exclusion law. And, you know, it's too bad that his vision never got instituted, he was assassinated before he should, could push through his vision. But so that's where I'm borrowing that idea from, redo the system. So he would have said the same thing. He would say, abolish the visa system and do it over. Well, that's quite a proposal. I, I just uh, uh, hope that some radical changes, some uh, major changes will come to immigration because at this time it appears that uh, everybody knows the immigration system is not working and uh, there are the major flaws in the system but uh, it's just uh, too big to 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 transform it to change it and uh, let's hope that your scholarship your advocacy and your colleagues and uh, we all work together and uh, to uh, appeal uh, to the elected officials, then they have they finally going to uh, reach the conclusion that something must be done. Uh, otherwise, the the consequences and going to be uh, going to hurt our economy and hurt uh, uh, us as a nation of immigrants. We uh, normally have uh, two generic questions for our distinguished guest, and uh, we have like uh, five minutes left, but I do want to ask you these two questions, Professor. The first question is about time travel. Time travel permits, and if you have the opportunity to offer advice to your younger self in your 20s, what advice would you share? Well, you know, I. I have been very happy and blessed in my life. Um, and I think my main advice actually doesn't have much to do with the professional side of my life, but it, mm. it's to make sure that your family is your most important priority. Because um, at the end of the day, no matter how much money you make or how many books you may write, the most important thing is family because you don't want to have a lonely existence. You want to have good friends and family. And so I would tell my younger self to make sure to take the time to, to love your family and enjoy your time with them because that's much, much more important than 
than fame or, or fortune. Thank you so much. That's very good advice. And if I were in my 20s, I would definitely listen to your advice. That will be the same advice I would give to myself in a younger self. Uh, uh, younger self. Uh, I, I, I have a much smaller family than yours, but uh, I totally understand uh, the importance and the ultimate importance of family and friendship played in. Uh, they are much larger, play much larger roles than uh, you know, work, I would say, and, and everything else. Uh, last question, Professor Hing. Uh, are there any specific, specific books or movies have deeply uh, uh, moved you, impressed you, and you would like to recommend to our audience? Feel free to recommend your own books. I'm going to recommend to the audience your new book, Humanizing Immigration. Well, thank you for recommending that. You know, you know the, the book. One of the books that I recently read, even though it's not a new book, it, I think it was written about uh, seven years ago, uh, six seven years ago. It's a book by an, uh, another Asian American woman, although her name is Duckworth, Angela Duckworth, and Duckworth. she's a, yeah, she's a, a, a psychologist, and she wrote a book called Grit, G R I T. Oh. Huh. What's important about that book is that. She is writes very convincing that it's not so much about talent or whether or not you have natural ability. It's actually, and I think Asians are going to like what I'm going to say. It's about hard work. It's about passion and work. Okay. Now, again, I'm reminding people the family is important, but if you put, it's not that there's, you're always going to meet somebody smarter than you. But one thing that you can always do is you can work harder. And mm -hmm. she measured the fact that the people who work the hardest, no matter what talent level they had, they actually accomplished the most. Mm -hmm. So I would say, don't give up. Keep your nose to the grindstone and you will be rewarded. Fantastic advice. Uh, 10,000 hours. I always remember that. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Tipping point basically argued that uh, uh, no matter which area, which discipline, you you uh, you have to devote it ten thousand hours of your life, put into it, and you will accomplish. Well, it is a fantastic uh, e uh, experience to meet you, Professor Hing, and to ask you all these questions. I'm extremely grateful for your scholarship and a contribution to immigration law. Uh, thank you again to be our guest. We look forward to continue to read your scholarship, and hopefully we can invite you back to the, on the show to discuss your next book and the next case. Thank Any you, tonight. Professor Dean. Thank you very much. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.